Good afternoon, and welcome to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and today is Tuesday, November 22nd, two days before Thanksgiving Day. And the program is live uh, between 2 and 3 in the afternoon Pacific Standard Time. If you're listening at that time and on that date, then you can participate in the program by calling this toll-free number, which is 1-800-438-5090. That's 1-800-438-5090. If you have a question about the Bible or Christianity, or you have a point of difference of opinion you'd like to express and even to defend, you're welcome to do that here. Uh, we're very open uh, mic kind of a program. Uh, there's no obligation for listeners to uh, to agree with the host or to treat the host like some kind of an authoritative guru. I don't claim any authority for my answers other than insofar as they are biblical. Uh, obviously, the Bible is authoritative. And I always attempt to give biblical answers. But, of course, uh, so do people who have different views than my own, which means the Bible sometimes is not as clear on some things as we wish it was, and uh, and for that reason, it's possible that although I attempt to give a biblical answer, you won't believe the answer is quite biblical enough, and you'd like to present a case for another view, in which case, I welcome you to do so. Uh, and, you know, one one reason I can do that is that I don't it really, in most controversial issues, I, I really don't care what anyone believes about them. I obviously will tell what I believe on a controversial point, but... It doesn't really matter to me if anyone else agrees with it, so I don't get emotional uh, about disagreements on those things. So I figure that the things that are necessary are plain in the Scripture, and the things that are not plain are apparently not necessary, else God would have made them plain. But they are interesting, and sometimes important in measure. You know, things that are not essential uh, may not necessarily be unimportant. And uh, so Christians can disagree on some things and still be godly, still be brothers, still be in fellowship, but still have an interest in convincing, you know, uh, dissenting parties that there's a that there's some value in a, in a different viewpoint than the one that uh, that party has. I'm interested in you hearing all the viewpoints here because I believe Christians ought to think for themselves. Yes, I believe that. Now, someone took me to task about that just uh, on the weekend because I said that in a lecture, and they said, you know, some people aren't very good thinkers, and they don't, you know, thinking for themselves isn't uh, really possible uh, responsibly because they don't have all the facts and don't know how to process the evidence and things like that. And I guess that's just a chance I'm willing to take. I'm not going to assume that everyone has to let me do their thinking for them, not at all, or that anyone else should do your thinking for you. The Bible says in First John 2 that you have no need that any man teach you, but if you have the Holy Spirit, that anointing dwells in you, and... He teaches you all things, eventually. Now, it doesn't mean you'll know everything right away. That certainly is not the case. But in time, God will at least, through his Holy Spirit, teach you everything you need to know if you are a true uh, born-again disciple of Jesus and have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it's not my job to make you believe anything in particular. But I'll be glad to tell you why I believe what I do, and I'll be glad to hear why you believe what you do, if it's different than than what I believe. So give me a call at one 800 438 Nine zero one eight hundred four three eight fifty ninety. Our first caller today is Rashad from Elmont, New York. A frequent caller and a welcome one. Hello, Rashad. Hi, Steve. How are you doing today? Good. Good to hear from you. Good. Good. Um, well, this is my this is my question today. It's um it's about what's what's the difference between um Hades and hell, and then and then to and to contrast that heaven and in um, paradise. Oh, okay. Uh, well, that's a matter of interpretation on the second point. The first point shouldn't be too difficult to answer. I'm getting some. Uh, I'm getting some uh, echo in my head. So I don't know if that's at your end or in my studio. But uh, are, is your radio on or anything? No. Okay. Well, it's just my maybe it's in my headset. Okay. Well, Hades and hell. What's the difference? That depends on what we mean by the English word hell. There is no. Greek or Hebrew word hell in the Bible. Therefore, the word hell only appears in English translations. And for most people, the word hell means a place where unbelievers go after the judgment. And most Christians throughout history believe that's a place of eternal torment, of flames and fire and brimstone and so forth. Now, if that's what we mean by the English word hell, 
then the closest thing we have to it in the Bible is the description of the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20. It's also mentioned in Revelation chapter 14. And uh, that's the place where apparently, at the point of the judgment, after the great white throne judgment, those who are not found written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. And, uh, and it's, that, that appears to be, the lake of fire appears to correspond with our traditional ideas of hell. Now, the word Hades is not to be identified with the lake of fire. And therefore, if the lake of fire is what we think of as hell, then Hades isn't hell. Because we read in Revelation chapter 20 that death and Hades will be cast into the lake of fire. Yeah, and doesn't so, make sense that hell is going to be cast into hell. Exactly. So Hades is something different than the lake of fire. It will be cast into the lake of fire, but it's different. So if we use the word, English word hell to mean the place of, uh, you know, ultimate judgment of the wicked, then Hades isn't that. There's a difference between Hades and hell. Now, that's a bit of a problem for the average person trying to understand the subject, because in the Bible, traditionally, in the King James Version, for example, the word Hades has often been translated with the English word hell. Mm -hmm. And so there's statements made about Hades, which the average unsuspecting reader, if they're reading uh, a traditional translation, they'll think that that's talking about hell. And it isn't, because the word Hades doesn't mean hell. The word Hades simply means the place of the dead. And sometimes it's translated the grave, because that's sometimes what it's talking about. Sometimes it's translated uh, hell in the traditional versions. But really, the difficulty is of finding a good English word to translate the word Hades is reflected in the fact that many modern translations just leave it untranslated. That is, when the Greek word Hades appears in the New Testament, Many modern English translations just leave it as Hades, and they don't try to find an English word for it, because they know that the word hell is not an adequate translation of that word. Now, there is an equivalent in the Hebrew to Hades, and that is the word Sheol. Yeah. And, the, and the, in the Hebrew language, Sheol is interchangeable with Hades in the Greek language. And both words are found frequently in the Bible, and both have been, in traditional translations, translated as hell. But again, it's quite a mistake to think of Hades or Sheol as what we normally think of as hell. So there is a distinction. Sheol or Hades probably just refers to the place where dead people go, and it can refer to the place where their dead bodies are, which, which is why it's translated the grave sometimes. Or it can refer to the place where their souls go, uh, as when Jesus, in the story of Lazarus and the rich man, spoke of the rich man in Hades, you know, looked up and saw Abraham and, and Lazarus in, in Abram's bosom. And if this is a literal story, which has been disputed by many, but if it is literal, then Hades also refers to a place where dead souls are, or dead people are beyond the grave, but not hell. So there is a distinction. Now, between heaven and paradise, this is difficult because the word paradise is used more than one way in the Bible. Sometimes the word paradise is used to mean the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, it, it, at least one time, it refers to heaven itself, or what Paul called the third heaven. Because in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul said he knew a man who was caught up into the third heaven, even into paradise. So he's obviously using the word paradise as a synonym for the third heaven, or for heaven. Uh, and then on the other hand, in the book of Revelation, it talks about those who overcome will eat of the tree of life that grows in the paradise of God. Well, in Revelation chapter 22, we find that the paradise of God, where the tree of life grows, is not heaven, but it's the new Jerusalem, which is on the new earth. So we can see that the word paradise is used a variety of ways in Scripture, just as it is in modern English. I mean, I might describe Hawaii as paradise, or Tahiti as paradise, or Santa Cruz, California, where I live, as paradise. Because the word paradise is a generic term. Actually, the word paradise is not of Greek origin. It's, uh, it's Persian. It's a Persian word. And it literally means a pleasure park. Uh, a park or uh, you know, some grounds that are beautiful. Which is why the term is used of a variety of places. Now, if you wonder what the difference is between heaven, on the one hand, and the paradise that's in Revelation, which is the New Jerusalem, my answer would be, if I understand the Bible correctly on this, that heaven is where God lives right now, where the angels live, 
and where Jesus is with, with the Father at the right hand of God. And where we go if we die, that is, if I die right now, I expect my spirit to go directly into the presence of Christ in heaven. But I don't expect to be there forever, because I don't expect Jesus to be there forever. It says in the, uh, in the book of uh, Acts, it says the heavens must receive Christ until the time of the restoration of all things. So Jesus isn't in heaven permanently. He's going to come back here. When we read the description of the new Jerusalem, which is in the new earth in Revelation, we find that Jesus is there. He lives in the new Jerusalem. And so will we. So that's not heaven. So I understand heaven to be the spiritual realm where our spirits will go if we die before Jesus returns. Although our bodies will be in the ground, our spirits will be with Christ in heaven until the second coming. But at the second coming, he will come back. He'll bring us with him who have been with him in heaven. He'll raise our bodies out of the ground. There will be a reunion between our spirit and our body. And we will live in the new Jerusalem on the new earth forever. And so heaven is not our permanent or eternal home. But some people use the word heaven as wrongly as the word hell is used. You know, just traditionally people have spoken of Hades as hell which is, as I said, not a really good translation of it. Likewise, people talk about the pearly gates and the streets of gold in heaven. But in fact, the, the pearly gates and the streets of gold are part of the description of the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21 and not of heaven. But people sometimes use the word heaven to mean just where Christians go to live forever. But technically, heaven is something else than that. We're going to live forever in the new Jerusalem, which is called the paradise of God in the book of Revelation. Okay, so um, it, it, you, meant, you had mentioned um, the story with um, Lazarus and the and the rich man. I, um, yeah. My question was kind of going towards that. It's what what's being described um, there, and how how is it supposed to be taken? Where you know he's saying he he said you know you know send send Lazarus to dip his tongue in water, you know dip his finger in water, touch my tongue. You know, what 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 are we to understand um, is going on there? Because because my understanding is if. You know, one. You know, when we don't need a. You know, once you're outside your your body, you don't need to drink or eat or anything like that. So I I don't know. I don't understand what's going on there. Why would he be thirsty or anything like that? Well, that depends on how the story of Lazarus, the rich man, is uh, conceived. There's there's at least three opinions I know about. One is that it's an actual story, a true story, and an actual case of two men who died. Uh, and that is the view I was raised with and pretty much have held most of my life. Another view is that it's a parable, and that it's not about an actual case. Uh, but that would nonetheless raise the same questions, because even if it's a parable and not an actual case, it would still be a true-to-life case, because parables are that way. Yeah. Parables tell stories that are like real life. Uh, I mean, they may be talking about some spiritual truth, but they're telling a story that's like real life. So if the story is only a parable, it still would confirm the kind of existence after the grave that, you're, that we're struggling with here. A third view, which I've only recently become aware of, is that the story of Lazarus the rich man was a well-known story from uh, ancient rabbinic literature, that Jesus and his disciples and his audience were aware of it because it, it is said to have been found in an earlier Jewish writing. Now, I don't have that writing, and I've looked for it on the Internet. I haven't been able to find it. But it's quoted by some scholars, uh, in fact, quite a few people on the Internet, if you look it up, uh, will make reference to this Jewish document that contained it. Now, since I haven't been able to find the Jewish document itself, it remains a matter of hearsay from my point of view. But if it is true that Jesus was uh, quoting a well-known Jewish story, maybe a well-known Jewish fable, and making it a point about it, uh, then we wouldn't have to assume that the circumstances described in the story are very much like reality, but rather they reflect some rabbinic ideas. And Jesus is not trying to affirm those ideas to be true so much as trying to use a well-known fable in order to make a spiritual lesson. Most people think that the story is told in order to make uh, uh, a distinction between the Jews who do not believe, represented by the rich man in Hades, and the Gentiles who come to faith and end up in the bosom of Abraham. And, the, you know, it's a little bit like what Jesus said on another occasion where he said to the Jews, 
many will come from the east and the west and will sit down in the kingdom of God with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the children of the kingdom, meaning the Jewish people who are unbelievers, will be cast out. And some understand the parable or the story of Lazarus and the return to be making that point, whether it's a true story or not. If it is not a true story, then it doesn't necessarily provide any basis for uh, our understanding of the way Hades really will be. I mean, if this is a story that originated with uninspired men, rabbis, some generations before Christ, and he's simply using it as an illustration, just like Jude uses something from the Book of Enoch, which most Christians don't believe is an inspired work, uh, you know, then, then that changes things. We, it means that we can't really use the story of Lazarus and the rich man to form a theological picture of what Hades is like. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah, it, I can see where the difficulty would come in, like, you know, where in verse 20, verse 24 where it says, um, no, Luke chapter 16 where it says that he's in agony in, in this flame. Well, right. If, if it is true, if it's a true story, we have to realize that this man is not bodily in flames, nor is Lazarus, who died bodily in the presence of Abraham, because both of those men's physical bodies could be found in their graves exactly. and being eaten by worms. But so, so we have to assume that if there's a, you know, a reality in this story, uh, then it must be the spirits of these men that are in another place after death. But if they are spirits, then obviously they're, they're not going to be bothered by physical flames and they're not going to be relieved by physical water on the physical tongue and so forth, in which case we'd have to say that there's something spiritual that corresponds to these things that's simply being described in terms that we understand physically. Uh, but that wouldn't be too surprising because Jesus told the woman at the well you know, that he'd give her living water and she would never thirst again, and she took it as literal water. But he meant the Holy Spirit, you know. So, I mean, it is possible for spiritual realities to be depicted in terms that, are, uh, that relate to our physical existence, though it's not really talked about a physical state. Okay. So that kind of clears it up for me a little bit. Okay. Well, it doesn't for me. I'm still, I'm still undecided. I'm sorry? I said it doesn't clear it up for me. I'm still undecided. Yeah. I uh, was going to say, um, well, then, have a happy Thanksgiving. Hope you have some good food and all that. Hey, you do the same. Okay, thank you. All right, God bless you, Rashad. God bless you, too. See you. Bye-bye. All right, well, we've got lines open for you now. If you have a question about the Bible or about Christianity or an objection to something, uh, to a view expressed by the host on this program, or maybe you're not, not a Christian, you've simply got an objection to Christianity as a whole, give us a call. Uh, we're looking for your call right now. The number is 1-800-438-5090. 1-800-438-5090 is the number. And uh, I have uh, some questions here that people have written in. I might just take one of these right now, but we do look for your call. I always prefer to talk to people live uh, rather than just read what they've written in. And, uh, no offense to those who write in their questions, but uh, i just like to... Uh, I'd like to hear your voice, too. Here's something that was uh, written in by, uh, I don't have the person's name. It says, uh, the pastor and elders of the church where I have been attending for several years have heard that I'm considering visiting around to other churches. And they have said that this is disloyal to my home church and that I should not change churches without being released by them, which sounds to me that they believe I need their permission to go to another church. Is this what the Bible teaches? Well, uh, no, no, the Bible doesn't teach that. It is the mentality that some churches do have. I'm, I'm aware of this uh, idea that you, uh, you are somehow in a, like a covenant relationship with, with the church you're in. And, you know, you can't really just walk away from it. You have to pretty much, uh, you know, be released by the leadership. This presupposes certain things about church relations that I don't find in Scripture. You have the uh, related concept. Sometimes here people have it as being covered by a church. You need a covering. Or you need to be accountable. Or you need to be submitted to, you know, the leadership of an, of a, of an organized church. Um, that, I mean, all, all I can say is, well, I, you know, even if this works out well, 
uh, for churches to practice it. It isn't anything that the Bible teaches. It, 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 the, the best that can be said of it is it's an extra-biblical idea. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says anything like that. And one of the reasons there isn't is because what we call a local church today uh, was non-existent in biblical times. And so, of course, the, the Bible doesn't anywhere talk about this, this kind of relationships with the local church. Uh, what and now the, the term local church was not found in, in the Bible, but if they had heard the term local church, I'm sure that what they would have thought of is the church in the town. Uh, there was the church in Corinth. There was the church in Philippi. There was the church in Thessalonica. And Paul wrote to them and, call, and spoke to them by, by those terms. He didn't use the term local church, but it's clear that the church in Philippi was the church that was local in Philippi and in Corinth and Thessalonica and so forth. Uh, but you see... What was different then, and why I say there was nothing like the modern local church in those days, is because the modern local church is uh, basically an organization that exists in a town alongside many other organizations that call themselves churches as well. And if they call themselves churches, uh, and they're not related to other churches in town, they certainly are reflecting a different mentality of church than that which was known in the biblical times. Because the, the Christians in Corinth, for example, all belong to the church in Corinth. If they began to meet in separate places and saying, some saying, I'm of Paul or I'm of Cephas or I'm of Apollos, this was viewed as a bad development. Uh, you know, that how, how can it be that the church, that the body of Christ in the town can be divided, Paul said. Paul found it actually uh, offensive uh, to suggest it. And so, uh, you know, what we have in the modern church world is lots of churches in the same town that aren't necessarily related to each other organizationally. Now, that's okay. I mean, let's face it, in a large town where there's lots of Christians, they can't all meet in one place. And if some of them meet over on this street and some meet on another street and some meet in this house and some meet in this assembly hall and, and so forth, that's not a violation of anything. I think even in biblical times, uh, the church in a town probably had several congregations several locations where they met simply for logistics purposes. It would be hard to get all the Christians in Rome into one building on a regular basis, so they probably, well, we know they met in Priscilla and, and Aquila's house and in some other households and so forth. But the difference there is that the different assembly places in biblical times in the same town were all related to each other. They all were one church in that town. Uh, you know, they, they didn't see themselves as competing organizations, and they weren't related to some organization that was translocal. Uh, I mean, I mean, the easiest way to explain this would be, for example, if, let us say, uh, an Assembly of God church in uh, in a given town, let, let's say Santa Cruz, where I live. Now, I, I, this is not to reflect on the Assembly of God church in this town. I'm not familiar with it, but it's, it'd be true of any denominational church in any town. Just to make an example, the Assembly of God church in Santa Cruz, let us say, uh, let's say the pastor dies or he gets called somewhere else. Well, where are they going to get another pastor? Well, they're not going to call up the Baptist Church or the Four Square Church or the, uh, you know, uh, the Presbyterian Church and say, well, could you send us over a pastor? We've just lost our pastor. They're going to call the Assembly of God headquarters, uh, you know, on the other in Missouri, Springfield, Missouri, and they're going to say, you know, we need some, we need a, you know, a pastor. And so a, a pastor will probably be sent in from some other place because the church wouldn't think of asking one of the other churches in the same town to supply the, the lack. And again, I'm not reflecting on that particular denomination. I could have, I could have mentioned any denomination in any town, and the same thing would be true. Uh, because, I mean, this reflects the fact that churches, denominational churches today, local churches, usually feel more connected to churches that are like themselves in other locations, even on the other side of the country, than they feel connected to the church down on the next corner that isn't as much like them. And that's what we don't find in the Bible. Now, the idea of visiting around churches, if you're in Santa Cruz, let us say, that's where I live, that's why I give the example, and you visit a different church every Sunday, a different assembly, you're not visiting different churches. There's only one church in Santa Cruz. It has many congregations. If the leaders of those churches feel they own you and that you're being disloyal by visiting another church, then I think they've got the wrong attitude toward church. It certainly is not one that's taught in the Bible. Uh, you are Christ's sheep. He is the shepherd. And he owns you, and if he wants to guide you to a different pasture, he can do that. And the pastor of that pasture should not, you know, think he owns you once you arrive there. Uh, if you belong to the body of Christ, 
you belong to the whole body of Christ. Now, there's something to be said for settling into one congregation and attending regularly, in my opinion. Uh, I think it's good if you can find a good one, because obviously that's the only way you'll really develop deep relationships long term. Uh, that's especially important, I think, if you're raising kids. They need to have, there need to be families, Christian families, that you're getting to know over a period of years, preferably, so that your kids can have good relationships, uh, you know, long-term relationships, rather than moving around every week or every few weeks or every few years so that you have to dislodge and, and make all new friends all the time. I, I think there's something really to be said for staying in one church, but it's not a biblical obligation. It's simply a, a logistic advantage. And what was the other question there? Uh, Oh, yeah, do you need permission to go to another church? No, of course you don't need permission to go to another church. But the, but you said you've been attending this church, the same church, for years, and now you're visiting around, and, and the, the leaders feel like you shouldn't do that unless you get released. Their mentality is foreign to Scripture, but I can understand their sentiment, because if you've been in the same church for years, they have reason to see you as part of their circle, let us say. Not something they own, but part of the, you know, everyone has their own circle of fellowship, even if they recognize that Christians elsewhere are, you know, are also brothers and sisters, you can't relate with every Christian in town, and so you get close to some. Hopefully, you should. And once you've gotten close to a group of Christians in a church, if you stop associating with them and start looking for another, frankly, they feel robbed. And, uh, you know, they, they, need to, they need to not be offended by that, of course, because they don't really have a, a, an ownership of you. But at the same time, I think if you've been in the same church for years and they've gotten attached to you and you're attached to them, I think it'd be rather rude just to kind of slip out the back. I, I do think it would be wise to go to the leaders, or to, you know, and just say, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about visiting somewhere else. I hope you don't mind. I'm, you know, no offense. Uh, on the other hand, of course, if, if you're leaving because you are offended by something, uh, that should be dealt with too. You should, you should talk to them about what you're offended by, and if, if resolution can be made bet between you and them, that's what's desirable. If not, and then, you know, you might end up going somewhere else. But I think, I think people that have been ministering to you and you've been fellowshipping with for years kind of have a right, in a sense. I mean, it's not, not something they could take you to court about, but I think just kind of in a relational dynamic, they kind of have, have the right to, for you to say goodbye to them in a, in a, you know, a polite way rather than just to disappear from their lives. And I, uh, so it's not so much that the Bible requires you to be released by the church or get their permission, but just, I think, for the sake of relationships, you shouldn't. I, I think you should, uh, you know, leave a church that you've been in for a long time. If, if you leave at all, I think you should leave uh, on friendly terms and with full mutual communication and, and so forth. Unless, of course, you're leaving the church because there's something really bad going on in the church that's been addressed and hasn't been fixed and can't be fixed, and so you're just leaving. I guess sometimes you have to do that, but I don't know. It's it's a hard thing because, as far as I'm concerned, every Christian belongs to the whole body of Christ. And every church in a given town is part of, the, part of the one church in that town. So to visit a different congregation on a Sunday than the one you usually go to is not disloyalty, because your loyalty is to Christ, not to Paul or Apollos or Cephas or a denomination. Your loyalty is to Christ. And as long as you're not disloyal to him, then the people who feel you're being disloyal by not continuing in their church, they need to deal with it. And they they got to realize that, I mean, I can understand them being sorry about you leaving, but that they, they got to deal with the fact that they don't own you and that God is your shepherd, and he's going to lead you where he's going to lead you. That would be my uh, response to your question. Uh, let's talk to uh, Slim, who's calling us from Salinas, California, and we have lines open for you. If you'd like to be on the program, if you have a question from the Bible or about Christianity, or you differ with the host on something, want to say so and say why, here's the number, 1-800-438-508. 90. We have less than 25 minutes left, left of the program, and we have lines open for you. If you want one, take it. 1-800-438-5090. Slim, welcome to the program. Thanks for calling. Good to hear from you again. Yeah, you too. Hey, uh, someone asked me a question last night, and I couldn't uh, respond to it at that time, so I thought I'd uh, pass it by and see what you could uh, come up with. In Revelation 22, uh, verses uh, 8 through, I believe it was uh, 13, it seems that the, consi the consistent flow of that passage has an angel giving uh, this, uh, this message, this vision to John, and the an angel says, don't bow down to me. 
and the same angels are saying that I am uh, the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega. So it could uh, be God. You know, I, I realize that it does seem that way, and uh, yet I think it must not be. Because Jesus, Jesus never objected to people worshiping him when, when he was on earth. There were many times people bowed down to him. They grabbed his feet to, to pay homage to him. Uh, Thomas fell down before him and said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus never said, Don't do that. Only worship God. Uh, because apparently he did not think it was inappropriate. But this angel that uh, is directing John around here uh, said, See that you don't do that. For I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. So the, the person speaking there clearly is not God. He's, he's uh, disclaiming any right to be worshipped. In fact, he says it's inappropriate, because he's just a servant of God. Now, on the other hand, a few verses later, in verse 12, somebody says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. And in verse 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Now, the same speaker was in chapter 1. He said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He says, I am the Almighty. So we know that whoever is saying, I am Alpha and Omega, is the Almighty God, because that, those terms are used in the book of Revelation, you know, uh, interchangeably. Uh, let, me, let me find the place in verse 8 of chapter 1. Chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord who is and was and is to come, the Almighty. Now, Almighty is El Shaddai, the, the, a reference only to Yahweh, to God. Now, the, the person who speaks in Revelation 1 in that way, uh, a little later, says in verse um, 18, I am he who lives and was dead. So, okay, the person who says, I'm Alpha and Omega, I'm the Almighty, also says, I'm alive, but I was dead. It's obvious who's here. This is Jesus speaking. So, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the Almighty, and he's speaking again in Revelation 22, 12. Now, it's true, there's no notification in Revelation 22 that the speaker has changed, except from the content of what is said. But that's not real unusual in prophetic books. Um, you know, if you read the Old Testament prophets, sometimes God is speaking in the first person, sometimes the prophet is speaking uh, and speaks of God in the third person. Uh, and so forth, and the speaker sometimes changes uh, without notice. And so when that happens, it's inconvenient for the reader, <laughs> uh, but at the same time, you can often, uh, I, I think normally, tell that the speaker has changed because of what they're saying, and th this is the case with that. I believe that the angel is speaking in Revelation 22, verses 8 through 11, but it seems clear that it's, uh, it's Jesus speaking in verses 12 and 13. Would there be a, uh, could you give me a, a scriptural uh, verse of that in the Old Testament that has some uh, similar that I can uh, share with this individual? Well, uh, I come up, think of something offhand. Okay, off the top of my head, I can't, but I could, if, if I would sit down and read through about three chapters of Ezekiel or three chapters of Isaiah, you'd find it changing. You'd find that sometimes the speaker speaks and says, I am Yahweh, I will do so and so, and this is my, you know, determination. And other times, the same prophet writing says, and the Lord will do this, and the Lord will do that, speaking of the Lord in the, second per in the third person. And uh, so, I mean, there, it doesn't, in those cases, it doesn't tell us that there's going to change the speaker, but you can just see that it, there is, you know. Is that because it's in English, or would, would no. it be the same from the Greek? No, it's the same in the original languages. Original yeah, the, language. So you just yeah. have to know the context of... Uh, which isn't difficult, which isn't difficult. You know, when God is saying, I will do this, I am this way, uh, it's generally clear in the prophets that, that, that Yahweh is the one speaking. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, when the prophet says, Yahweh says, and Yahweh will, will, will do such and such, and you can tell that it's the prophet speaking about Yahweh. And likewise, in the passage in Revelation, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not clear from the, any direct statement that the speaker has changed, but it's clear from the content of the statements. And is, the there, change. is there a theological term for that? For that, mm, for that phenomenon, no, I'm not aware of any. I, I mean, there there may be one, but I'm not I'm not theologically trained. Okay. All right, then. No, that, uh, that helped a little. So well, it, uh, huh? Uh, yeah, I don't know that it helps all that much, except yeah. to say that you've got to be aware that 
there's no possibility. There's no right. possibility in my judgment that the first speaker there is Jesus. Right. Yeah, and there's it no ex explains that, but if uh, if uh, and, Nephi and there's also would read that. Right. And there's also no possibility. There's also no possibility that the speaker in verses 12 and 13 isn't Jesus, mm -hmm. because he's been identified unmistakably in chapter one. But if the, the average, but if the average person would read this, they would, they would, it would bring questions to their mind regarding that. Well, unless they took into consideration the whole pass, the whole book. I mean, like I said, they might wonder why it's that way, but it wouldn't be hard to tell that it is. Right, right. I mean, this. It, it, to my mind, it's not obscure at all when Jesus says, I, I'm coming quickly, right. even though it doesn't say that he is Jesus speaking, although, uh, it seems, you know. The flow seems to seem, to seem to suggest that the messenger is saying this about right, himself. Right, but if, if, if you look a few verses later, though, in verse 16, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things. Right. So, so we have Jesus speaking, identifying himself, and saying that there's another being, his angel, Right. That was testifying to these things, mm -hmm. and that's and that's the angel that wouldn't allow himself to be worshipped. Right, right. See, that same angel, that same angel that was showing John around mm -hmm. on an earlier occasion, told John not to worship him. You know, in chapter 19 and verse 10, it says, "I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that, right. for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus.' So, so the speaker is not Jesus; he's someone who has the testimony of Jesus." And, and Jesus says in chapter 22, 16, I sent my angel to testify. So it's, it's clear that the primary speaker in these passages is the angel that Jesus sent to testify. The angel distinguishes himself from Jesus. But then at times Jesus himself speaks when he says, I, Jesus, have sent my messenger to testify, and I am Alpha and Omega. Right. So it's, a, it's kind of mixed up there. But, you know, if you have a, if you have a, a Bible that's got red letters, for the saints of Jesus, it's, it's perhaps a little less confusing because you can see when Jesus is the speaker. Well, that's what the individual used. <laughs> yeah. Read the red, the, the red letter yeah. edition to, to right. justify his point. Well, the, the point uh, the point is there are some st statements there that clearly are not Jesus speaking, and there's some where clearly Jesus is speaking. Right. Right. And then there's then there's verse 16 where Jesus clearly identifies himself as the speaker, and he makes reference to the other speaker. Right. The angel, yeah. So if we take the, just the whole consistency of the, the, the message and what the scripture generally speaks about, we should come to that conclusion. We would have to, even, even if we had only the book of Revelation to go by. Right, right. Yeah, even if we didn't have the other rest of the scripture. Yeah. All right, well, that'll, that'll work. Okay, now okay, nice sir. to you. All right. Great, great talk to you. Have a good Thanksgiving. Okay, you too. Bye-bye now. All right. Well, we have about so what, 15 minutes left, and we got lines open for you. Would you like to ask a question or call with a matter of disagreement or matter, just need some clarification on something? Give me a call. The number is 1-800-438-5090. 1-800-438-5090. I, I believe we'll be uh, playing a recorded program on Thursday, which is Thanksgiving. Uh, so just so you'll know that we don't know whether uh, – you know, on, th on on holidays, it's it's kind of hard to expect people to call in. Uh, the program runs, you know, early afternoon when a lot of people will be eating and so forth. So we're going to play a recorded program. But so today, Tuesday, and tomorrow and Friday, we'll have live programs. And you can call in with your questions. You can do that today. And we're going to talk next to Mark, who's doing just that, from San Jose, California. Mark, welcome to the program. Thank you. Yeah, um, I've been a Christian for several decades, and I've often heard the phrase that when you become a Christian, you invite Jesus to come to live in your heart. And I was just curious about that because I've actually been trying to find verses in the New Testament that support that idea, and I'm able to find several that say that the Spirit, I assume that would mean the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God dwells within you, but I'm not able to find the idea that Jesus dwells within you. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Uh, yeah, well, you're right. For the most part, the Bible doesn't talk, well, certainly the Bible nowhere talks about inviting Jesus into your heart. But it does speak of Christ dwelling in your heart by faith. Uh, it doesn't say uh, that this is because of your uh, inviting him into your heart. But, but nonetheless, the place uh, that speaks of Christ dwelling in your heart, uh, there, are, there are references to it. One of the places I'm thinking of is in Romans chapter 8, where uh, quite interestingly, Christ being in your heart 
is spoken of synonymously with uh, the Holy Spirit being in your heart. If you look at Romans chapter 8, it says, uh, let me see, in verse 9 and 10, it says, if you, it says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, notice there are three expressions that Paul uses interchangeably. The first of them is, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. The second one is, if Christ, uh, having, if you have the Spirit of Christ. Now, notice he changes the term uh, Spirit of God to the term Spirit of Christ at that point. And then, uh, and then he says, and if Christ is in you. So he's using these terms all interchangeably, where uh, Christ is in you, the Spirit is in you, and the Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. So, in the sense that the Spirit that dwells in you is the Spirit of Christ, this apparently allows uh, us to say that uh, you know, Christ is in your heart. There is, uh, I'm, I, frankly, I'm, I'm looking for another, uh, another place where this is found. Uh, in Colossians 2, uh, 3.15, for example, it's not exactly right. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. But Christ being in your heart is something that is uh, very seldom spoken of in those terms. Okay, so would you say that it is correct then, uh, for example, with the sinner's prayer, to say that, you know, you you invite Christ to come live within you? Would you say that's correct? It's, it, it would be correct, but it would be extra, uh, it would be extra biblical. That is okay. to say, it's, it's, it's not a biblical expression. There is in Ephesians 3.17, this statement says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. But, it, again, it doesn't talk about inviting Jesus into your heart. In fact, it doesn't really talk about inviting the Holy Spirit into your heart. It talks about asking God to give his Holy Spirit. And when he does give his Holy Spirit, then, of course, Christ dwells in you through the Spirit of Christ. We have to remember that one reason that the Bible doesn't speak of Christ dwelling in your heart more than it does is because Christ himself is at the right hand of God Right. in heaven. He's not in my heart. But insofar as his Spirit has come to live in my heart. Uh, in a sense, you could say he dwells in my heart because that's his spirit in there. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, by the way, when it comes to telling people to pray the sinner's prayer and invite Jesus into their hearts, that, I can say that that is not something that the biblical writers ever did. They, they never right. told people to do that. They told them to repent of their sins and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and, of course, uh, to recognize him as the Lord. Now, when a person does that, we might argue, well, then, then the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Christ comes into the believer. But that happens without them making a reference to it in their prayer, apparently. Okay. And I'm afraid that sometimes evangelicals reduce things to neat little formulas that are really kind of meaningless to the people. Like, if you tell an unbeliever, uh, you need to ask Jesus into your heart, what in the world does that mean to him? What, what does it mean to him for Jesus to be in his heart? I know a lot of people, you know, when their children have come to be Christians, uh, they teach their children to respond to the question, where's Jesus? Right. By saying, in my heart, you know. Well, actually, Jesus is in heaven, at the right hand of God, the Father. That's where Jesus is. But uh, his spirit is in me. But asking people to have Jesus come into their heart, I mean, I I've really tried to figure out what an unbeliever would understand that term to mean. I was, I was raised with that terminology. And so it has a certain distinct imagery that it calls to my mind. But I've, I've tried to put myself in the position of an unbeliever and, and say, well, would telling him to ask Jesus into his heart communicate to him that he has to repent of his sins and live a life of faith and have a transformed life? Or, or does he just think that Jesus is looking for a place to get in out of the cold and his heart's as good a place as any? You know, this idea that Jesus stands at the door and knocks in Revelation 3.20 has been interpreted as if Jesus is standing at the door of the heart. Yeah. But but in the context, it's not saying that at all. It's saying he's he's outside the church trying to get in. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to me that it's probably simply correct to say that you just ask for the Lord's forgiveness and he's your Savior rather than saying, you know, invite him to come live in your heart. Yeah, I, I would simply say, 
uh, repent of your sins and surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus. Now, even that is terminology that isn't found exactly in the Bible. Surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus is not found there. But I believe that is a terminology that expresses what a person is expected to do better than just saying, ask Jesus into your heart. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. All right. Good talk to you, Mark. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Let's talk next to a Fred who's traveling somewhere. We don't have a location. Uh, we'll, uh, we've, got our, we've got our satellite searching you out, Fred. We'll soon know where you are, but go ahead and talk. Hi. Yeah, this is Fred. You talking to you uh, you're not very clear. I hope you're in a. I hope you're moving into a better cellular area. But go ahead. I hope so. Uh, well, I will take that Revelation three twenty uh, one and uh, verse indicates the individual because he addresses with the Jesus has the Lord is here, and he says that if any man, not any church, any man here, my boy, I'm to come into him, not them, and. You'll check his sin, and he would be speaking to an individual, not a church congregation. I don't know how ever be interpreted to, to the church. I can you know, understand that some would interpret it to that they would see the land of the two and church as being Christ outside the church, so I'm not going to get in. Fred, I've got to say, your, your voice is so garbled, I, I can't make out most of what you're saying, but I did catch, I did catch your basic thought. Uh, are you moving into a direction where your your cell phone will be working better? Because uh, it's not working very well. I can hear you pretty well. Okay. Uh, I right. moved into a bad location. Okay. Well, I you know the the, the reception is so terrible. I'm gonna have to hang up. But you can call back if you're in a good spot. That's if you got right. if you get some more bars. All right. Thanks for calling. I do know what Fred said uh, somewhat. Uh, I I caught enough of it to figure. Uh, he's responding to the statement that I made that when Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock, he's not talking about the door of the heart. He's talking about the door of the church. And Fred uh, made uh, a good point uh, in saying that, well, the, the verse goes on to say, if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me, which sounds like he is knocking at the door of the heart. And I think that, uh, you know, I can understand why he would take it that way and, and why other evangelicals have done so. And my understanding is that the church of Laodicea, to whom he said this, has essentially put Jesus, you know, on the outside without realizing it. He's knocking, and he's wondering if there's anyone, any man in the church who hears Jesus knocking. That That, that is who, you know, a person in the church who realizes that Jesus is basically not in there anymore, but knows that he wants to come in and will will open the door to let him in. And uh, if he does, Jesus will come into him. Now, into him, I understand we would probably take to mean um, into his body or into his heart, though he doesn't use that term. I think to say he would come in to him, I think what it means is he will come in the church to him, to the man who opened the door to him, and, uh, and will sup with him. That the man who opens the door of, uh, for Christ to come in, will personally enjoy Christ's fellowship uh, and, and maybe, you know, maybe uh, without the rest of the church even acknowledging it, hard to say. Uh, it certainly does speak of a personal relationship and personal communion that Jesus is offering. And I can see why someone might think that it's talking about the door of the heart in this case. Uh, but I, my judgment is that he's not referring to the door of the heart, but he is certainly saying that the individual who hears him knocking can uh, can have a personal uh, communion with him and sup with him, that is, eat with him. Uh, so, I mean, it's not an issue I would fight over because it doesn't matter too much to me. Uh, but I, I still would say that the knocking on the door is knocking on the door of the church that he's been put out of, the church of Laodicea. If, uh, well, Fred or, or anyone else believes it's the door of the heart, it's not, not an issue that I would fight over. And I can see that there is a case that can be made for that. And although most of what you said, Fred, was, didn't come through very clear, uh, I did hear that much of it, so I, I realized that was your main point. I don't know if you wanted to make other points. And if you do, we have a few minutes left, not many, or you could call back if you're in a better, a better cellular area. Um, here's, a, here's a question that someone has written in. It says, if we pray to Mary or the saints, can they help us? Um, I don't think they can, but obviously... Uh, 
there is a difference of opinion between, uh, I guess what we say, between Protestants and Catholics on this matter. Um, Roman Catholics apparently believe that the saints are watching us, that they are listening to our prayers, and that Mary is also, and that and that uh, if we pray uh, in their direction, they can, at the very least, uh, repeat our prayers to God, or that they can pray on our behalf. Now, I don't. I guess all I can say is I don't find anything in the Bible that suggests any such thing. Uh, I don't know that the Bible even would encourage me to think that the saints are watching us once they've gone to heaven. Um, I think when they go to heaven, they're watching Jesus. They're, I think they're in the presence of the Lord, and they're absent from here, and I think they're glad to be absent from here and in the presence of the Lord. And I don't, I don't find anything in the Bible that would suggest that the people who've died and are saved and gone to heaven, that they, that they are somehow watching us or listening to us, and, or that they could hear us. And that, that applies to Mary as well. Now, the Roman Catholics think of Mary as somewhat in a different category, I think, than the rest of the saints, and that Mary is, uh, you know, considered to be somehow, uh, you know, has a privileged relationship with Jesus above that of all the saints. But uh, I, once again, this goes far beyond anything the Bible says. So if I was a Roman Catholic, um, I would, uh, I guess, be inclined to think that the saints and Mary can hear me and can respond to my prayers. But uh, I'm not a Roman Catholic, and because of that, I, because I'm pretty much stuck with what the Scriptures say on it, uh, I don't think they can. Now, even if the even if the saints were paying attention to what's going on on earth and were inclined to respond, I don't know how they, Mary or they, could uh, hear everybody who's praying to them at the same time. Now, I know how God can, because God is omnipresent and omniscient. But I don't know, uh, you know, certainly Mary and the saints are not God, and therefore they're not everywhere at once. Uh, you know, God's ability to hear all prayers at once have to do with his special divine attribute of omnipresence. Uh, when we go to heaven, we don't become God. We don't become omnipresent or omniscient or, or omnipotent like he is. And therefore, Mary and the saints who have gone on to heaven are not really in a position to be hearing all the prayers around the world that people are praying to them. And I think it's sad because God is able to, and the people who are praying to Mary or the saints could be praying to God instead, and then they'd be heard. Uh, and and we've had talks before with Roman Catholic scholars who have disagreed with me on this point, and I, you know, uh, they, they want to defend uh, prayer sent in the direction of these, these people who have gone on to heaven, but uh, my thought is why? Why bother? When Jesus said we can go into the presence of the Father and He hears us and He cares about us, if I can do that, why would I want to send somebody else instead of me into the presence of God to ask that question? Um, I, I can't think of a reason in the world. But if I was going to send anyone, I'd send Jesus. But I don't even have to do that. I can come in Jesus' name. That's what Jesus said. She said, I don't say that I'll ask the Father for you. The Father loves you. You ask in my name. So I go to the Father and ask in Jesus' name. And Jesus said, he hears me and he cares about me. Uh, even if I even if I could talk to Mary in the same, why waste my time when I could talk to God himself? That's really the one that's going to answer my prayers. Well, so much time uh, we've had. We don't have any more. So we'll just have to wind this down. You've been listening to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg. We are a listener-supported broadcast. If you'd like to write to us, the address is The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 3633, Santa Cruz, California, 95063. Again, that's The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 3633, Santa Cruz, California, 95063. You can find that address. You can find many resources and information about this ministry or simply information about the Bible because there's a lot of recorded Bible teachings at our website. These are free. We don't have anything for sale at our website. You can just go there and take things. There's hundreds of MP3 files. There's printed materials. There's an access to a Bible forum where you can post questions and get answers. The website is www.thenarrowpath.com. Until tomorrow, this is Steve Gregg saying thanks for joining us, and I hope you'll tune in again tomorrow to continue this discussion. God bless.